you have your Bibles, please turn to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. For our guest, we are walking through the book of Revelation. Uh, we are going verse by verse and line by line. Uh, today, the title of the message is The Faithful Church. The Faithful Church. Folks, every church should be faithful. And with that, every Christian should be faithful. And that's what he is comparing to. He's talking to the seven churches in Asia, but he is comparing them to us as Christians in the application of the Word of God today. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, uh, the outline today, the faithful church, number one, the door of opportunity. The door of opportunity. Number two, the protection of Jesus. I hope you understand we are under the divine protection of God. He is in control, folks. He is in control. And number three, the blessings of God. Folks, we are a blessed church. We are a blessed people. We have been chosen by God. And of all the the seven churches, uh, this is the most positive uh, lesson that we will be studying the faithful church. You know, the city of Philadelphia was the youngest of the seven cities that we have talked about. It was established around 189 BC. It was located at the junction of several trade routes on the Imperial Post Road. Uh, it was also called the Gateway to the East. Philadelphia was built on a plateau, but it was not a military outpost. It was built to be the center of Greek culture and language. Two natural disasters uh, plagued the region around Philadelphia. The first one was earthquakes. They had several earthquakes, and they also had an active volcano. Uh, Makes you not really want to live close to Philadelphia, if I was thinking. One earthquake basically destroyed the city. Philadelphia literally means city of brotherly love. The church truly had a heart for people, and they shared the gospel with people in their daily lives. While they were small in numbers, they were effective in ministry and loved the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. It was the second church Jesus had no condemnation for. If you remember, Smyrna was that way also. It was a place where many pagan temples were founded, which gave the church a great opportunity to for ministry. In two words I want you to remember today in about Philadelphia. They were about missions and they were about ministry. And folks, I believe every New Testament church should be about uh, missions and should be about ministry. Let's look at the faithful church. Number one, the door of opportunity. Verse seven, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, And we have this opening that's always there to the angel. We have the closing that is always there. He that has an ear, let him hear. So there is no change in this chapter. And it says, these things says he who is holy. Again, the descriptions here are always of Jesus Christ himself. And we as Christians need to emulate Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ needs to be our role model. Jesus Christ uh, here is saying he is holy. And folks, I truly don't believe we can grasp the word holy in our finite minds. And do you know why? Because we have a sinful nature. Because we fight sin every day. You have to understand what holy means. God is holy. Jesus is holy. They are pure. They are perfect. They are perfect. And Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God, lived 33 years here and never sinned. And folks, this is what you say. Because I know what some people think. Well, we can't do that. Well, no, you can't be perfect. But folks, we should strive for perfection. We should strive for holiness. Being like Jesus is being holy. 
And then it says, not only is Jesus holy, three things he says here, he is true. He is true. What is true? True is true to his word. True is truth. He never lies. He never lies. True is Jesus Christ. The Bible says, I am the way, Jesus said, the truth and the life. You realize some people don't want to hear the truth. They don't want to hear that there's a hell. They don't want to hear that they need to live a godly life. They don't want to hear, and that's what we do sometimes. We as a Christians, we take it like a smorgasbord. If I don't like this, it's kind of like when I'm not on a strict diet, one of my rules is don't eat anything that's green. Okay? Why? Because it's good for you. And even in our lives, we'll say, God, I'll take this. God, I'll take this. But, ooh, don't challenge me there. Oh, listen to me, folks. He is holy. He is sinless. He is truth. His word is truth. His word never fails. And then he says, he not only is true, he who has the key of David, has the key of David. And we know uh, Jesus in the Old Testament is the coming Messiah. And we know what keys are for. Keys open things. And that's where he says, he who opens and no one's shuts. There's two things I believe he is talking about here. He is, Jesus is the key to salvation. Folks, there are people that say there are many ways to, to heaven. And I tell you, the Word of God says, you come by the blood of Jesus Christ or you don't come. We're not being exclusive, we're being biblical. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is the key to salvation. But not only is he the key to salvation, we need to share that salvation and the gospel with others. That is the key. You want to haste his coming, you want him to come sooner, well, keep winning people to the Lord. Because we're looking for that last one. God knows the last one that's going to be saved. And when that person gets saved, he will turn over and look at Jesus and say, now go get my bride. We can haste the coming of the Lord with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's talking the key of salvation, but not only the key of salvation, Jesus is the key to ministry. To ministry and to mission. Missions are salvation. And ministry is pointing others to Jesus Christ. It's discipling others. This is what he is talking about here. He who opens and no one shuts, and shuts, and no one opens. Verse 8, I know your works. I see I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. No one. And folks, I know Satan is real. I understand that. But I got news for you. He is powerful, but God is almighty. He opens the doors. He shuts the doors. And there are times when he opens the doors, and you know what we need to do? We need to go to work. When he opens an opportunity, we need to go to work. And when he shuts doors, and here's where we have a big problem, we need to wait. What did Acts chapter 2 say? That group that gathered was waiting on the Holy Spirit. Folks, we are nothing without God. We are nothing without Jesus Christ. We are nothing without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. The Holy Spirit opens doors and closes doors. The Holy Spirit tells us when we need to do something and when we need to wait. So he's talking about the faithful church. The faithful church. And it says, I set for you open doors, knowing shut, for you have little strength. And again, little strength is really probably inside. Okay? But I'm telling you, you think of things that are powerful. I'm, I'm thinking of dynamite. It may come in a small stick, but it is powerful. It doesn't matter what the size of the church is. It's how faithful we are to Jesus Christ. And it says, 
and have kept my word and have not denied my name. The church at Philadelphia preached the word of God. It discipled from the word of God. It led people to Jesus Christ. It was a mission center according to history and biblical history and have not denied my name, which means there was persecution there. There really is. So we see when God opens doors, we need to walk through them and we need to work. And when God closes doors, we need to seek His will and we need to wait. Jesus is the key. The key is absolute authority. Matthew 28, hold your finger there. I know you know this, but we need to be reminder, reminded of what Jesus was about. He was about to leave this earth. He gathered his disciples. And in verse 18, Jesus, Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me. Folks, Jesus should be the center of our lives. Jesus should be our Lord and our master and Savior. And Jesus is telling them in heaven and on earth, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. You know what is amazing? When we say go, nowadays we don't have to get on a plane and, and fly some 2,000 miles for a mission field. Folks, there are unreached people groups in Fort Smith, Arkansas. There are unreached people groups in Dallas, Texas. There are unreached people groups in Cincinnati, Ohio. What has God done from us? He allowed them to come to us. And what do we do? Folks, you got to go. You know, sometimes we as Baptists, we don't want to go. I'm too tired. I don't want to go. We sit and we soak. And if we sit and soak long enough, we sour. <laughs> Folks, there's a mission field in your neighborhood. There is someone that watch you get in your car every Sunday and go somewhere Sunday. Hey, let's bake them some banana bread and take it across the street and invite them to our church. Baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. Folks, if you're looking for a place for the Trinity, I just read it to you. The Trinity is God the Father who created everything, God the Son who died on the cross for our sin, and God the Holy Spirit who is in every one of us. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And here it is, and lo, I am with you always. Do you realize you're never alone? Do you realize that God is always with you? Do you realize that the Holy Spirit, is, this is what he told his disciples. He told them to go, and I will give you the words to say, even until the end of the age. And folks, I am so glad that we are studying Revelation because the end of the age is coming soon. So we see the faithful church, the church of Philadelphia, God had high praise for them. Now, they weren't a perfect church. There is no such thing as a perfect church. And do you know why? There's no such thing as perfect people. But folks, we need to strive for per, uh, perfection. We need to be holy because Jesus is holy. We need to be true because Jesus is true. We need to recognize that Jesus is in God and the Holy Spirit is the key to everything we do. So we see the door of opportunity. Matter of fact, unbelief, not having faith, sees the obstacles. But faith sees the opportunity. See, and I'll say that again, unbelief sees the obstacle. We can't would be a word they say. We can't. Well, folks, my Bible tells me I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. And God opens doors, but faith sees opportunities. Folks, 
even in bad times, it's an opportunity to give praise to our Lord and Savior. So we see the door of opportunity. The second thing we see is the protection of Jesus. Indeed, I will make uh, those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Now, folks, there's liars out there. There are people that are going to pick on you. There's people going to persecute you. There are people that's going to say right is wrong and wrong is right. And for Jesus to say the synagogue of Satan, he is simply saying are influenced by Satan. They are not following God. They are not following the Word of God. And most of those do not like Christian people. They do not like to hear the Word of God. They do not like truth. Why? Because their life doesn't add up to that. And here he is saying, Satan is going to go come against you. If you are doing something for God, whether you are an individual or a church, you will be hassled by Satan. Spiritual warfare is real. He doesn't want you walking with God. He doesn't want you reading your Bible. He doesn't want you praying. He doesn't want you witnessing to your friends. And he'll do anything to stop that. But again, we cannot listen to his lies. Matter of fact, John 8, 44 says he is the father of lies. He started with Adam and Eve. He got Eve alone there and says, hey, did God really mean that? Did God really mean what he says? Hey, folks, I got news for you. God means what he says every time in the Word of God. If he says it's going to harm you, it's going to harm you. If it says you shouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it. And he is the father of lies. So no matter what town we're in, no matter where we go, there are people that are used by the devil and used by Satan to try to defeat us. Indeed, keep reading, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. What does that mean? We are under the divine protection of God. Folks, nothing catches God by surprise. Nothing in your life. God's never up in heaven looking down and saying, huh, where did that come from? He knows your life. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows what you're thinking. And that's not good sometimes, folks. I know in my mind that's not a good thing. But he protects us from Satan, from the evil one from the evil one. Psalm 27. Go with me to Psalm 27. Man, I love this scripture. Psalm 27. Man, when you're down and Satan is just beating on your door, when you're tired and feel like you can't go on, when you feel like you're losing the battle, would you turn to Psalm 27 and meditate on scripture? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The greatest tool of the devil is fear. The Bible describes him in 1 Peter as a roaring lion. He wants to intimidate you. He wants to make you think you're going to fail. He wants to, you to think that you're insignificant. He wants you to think that nobody cares. But I got news for you. God cares for you. God cares. The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? My strength comes from the Lord. My strength comes from the Lord. When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and my foes, they stumbled and fell. Folks, remember when Job come and did it? I mean, when Satan come and did his thing on Job? What did God say? One thing you cannot do. You cannot kill him. Because if Satan had his way, he would have took Job, Job out. Why? Because he was an right man. Because he followed God with all of his heart. Though an army may camp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me, this will I be confident. One thing I have desired from the Lord, and that I will see, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. Folks, you have to understand 
We cannot come to church once a week and expect to grow as a Christian. You can't. Do you eat one meal a week? I mean, we feed ourselves. Folks, we need to feed ourselves on the Word of God every day of our lives. You can't expect me to put Christian maturity in your heart. That's God's business. That's the Holy Spirit's business. That's why some people come, and, and again, I don't follow anybody home. I don't, go, I don't have a hidden mic anywhere. But I promise you today, somebody will go home and they'll just say, you know what, Brother Mike was a little off today. Just a little off. It's probably that pulse ox. It, it was a little low while he was doing that. And then someone else, during invitation time, coming down, and tears coming down their face, come to this altar, and they lay their life on the altar. What was the difference? One was looking for God, and one was attending worship. Folks, just because you come to church doesn't mean you're worshiping. And I'm saying here, he is saying, you can't do that, folks. Do you realize you can make every day a day of worship? It's up to you. It's up to you. And that's what he's saying. Why? Because I'm telling you, God's house of worship is open all the time. We don't have to come to a building. The building is not the church. And I realize people say, I'm going to church. Yes, we're going to church, but we're going to worship. Okay? We're going to worship. People are the church. Verse 5, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place in his tabernacle, he shall hide me, and he shall set me high upon a rock. I'm telling you, when the people in Philadelphia, when they were persecuted, when Satan was uh, trying to get in there, he's talking about, uh, uh, you know, the Jews that, that don't truly know Jesus Christ. False teachers false leaders, people that want to lead others away from Christ. You go to the rock. You go to Jesus Christ. You worship Christ. And we can do that every day of our lives. And it says, Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. Oh, listen to me, folks. God loves you. In one way or another, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, every knee will bow, every tongue confess, Jesus is Lord. Amen. And everyone in here is going to say it. All right? You ever talk to a little kid and they do something wrong? Tell them you're sorry. Tell them you're sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. I can't understand it. I'm sorry. They don't want to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, you will either bow down as Jesus being in your heart and your Lord and Savior, or you will bow down rejecting Christ and defending an eternity in hell, right. according to the Word of God. Right. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, Jesus is Lord. Folks, He is Lord. He is Lord. And we praise God for that. Let's look at verse uh, uh, 10. The rest of 10. Because you have kept my commandment and pers persevere, I will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test uh, those who dwell in the earth. And again, folks, here he is talking about the hour of, of, uh, of the hour of trial. He's talking about, I believe with all my heart, the great tribulation. The great tribulation. And I know there's, there's folks that don't believe the rapture of the church is the first thing on God's prophetic calendar. And I, I can sympathize some with mid-trib, but my heart of heart in Scripture says the rapture, on the rapture of the church is the next thing coming on God's 
prophetic calendar. Why? Because of John chapter 14. Look at John 14. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. Folks, we shouldn't worry. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And here it is, verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He's coming back. He's coming soon. We're going to go spend an eternity with him. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. I am coming again. Folks, if Jesus says he's coming again, he's coming again. 1 Thessalonians 4, we know that. We know 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Corinthians 15, for we all will be changed in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Folks, I believe with all my heart, we will be raptured out of this place. The Old Testament calls uh, the, the tribulation Daniel's 70th week, or the time of Jacob's trouble, and we will, we will talk about that uh, here in, it, well, it's, it'll be down the road in Revelation, but we will talk about that. And I believe, as I said in this sermon earlier, we are waiting for that last person to be saved. And God is going to rapture all of the Christians out of this play. Then there'll be three and a half years of so-called good times, three and a half years of peace, three and a half years, and then right in the middle, folks, I'm telling you, Satan and the Antichrist and the false prophet it's all going to break out, and it will be hell on earth. In the bowl judgments, all these things that are coming, you think we have natural disasters now, it will not hold a light during the second half of the Great Tribulation. So we need to be ready, folks. We need to be ready. Now look at verse 12. And he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of God. What is he talking about? Jesus is protection of Jesus and the blessing of God. Folks, I hope you understand what heaven is going to be like. I hope you understand that it, you cannot even, in our minds, we cannot fathom what heaven is like. And when you think of pillars, even then in those days, the biblical days that we are talking about, even when earthquakes happened, those pillars were strong. They were the foundation of buildings that were uh, really, really high at times. And even after an uh, 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 earthquake, you look up and the only thing that is standing are those pillars. And folks, I believe he is speaking about faithful Christians there. We are going to see Faithful Christian in heaven. Those people, uh, you know, and again, I, the, the first one I want to see, I want to see Jesus first, man. I want to see Jesus. And then I want to go find the Apostle Paul. And I want to ask him, hey, Paul, was the reason you did what you did and sacrificed your life and was beaten, persecuted, thrown out of towns, called liars and all of that, was it because of your past? Was it because of what you did when the, feet, when the clothes of Stephen's was laying at your feet? I just want to ask him. And a lot of people also this, well, I want to ask God something. Why don't, and you fill in the blank. And you know what I want to say? I want to say, I truly believe when we get to heaven, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. Even the Apostle Paul said in the book of Philippians chapter 3, forgetting those things which are behind and looking forward to those things that are ahead. Have you noticed when you drive a car 
and you look behind how small the river near is. Why? Because if you're driving that way, you don't need to be looking that way. That's just for backing. But have you noticed how big your windshield is? That's what's out ahead of you. Folks, we have to forget the past. He overcomes. will make him a pillar in the temple of God. And he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God. What is that? That's identification. Identification. If you look on my, my, my birth certificate, it'll say the place I lived was Lawton, Oklahoma. The year I was born was 1958. Okay, we have identifications of our birth. Okay, and there he is, he is writing his name. We are the people of God. I want, I want God's name on me. Matter of fact, I probably won't ever get a tattoo. Okay, and if you got a tattoo, I'm, I'm good with that. Don't, don't take this wrong. All right? But if I ever get one, I'm going to get one on my forehead. And I'm going to say, Jesus is Lord. All right? Now, I probably won't ever do that. Calm down now, okay? Just calm down. Why? Because I want everybody to know. And if somebody says, are you one of them Jesus freaks? Yeah, I am. Thank you for noticing. Folks, Jesus is Lord. Amen. In the name of the city, Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. I like my name. Michael's okay. My nickname was Taco. All right? I love tacos. I just always like Taco. But I get a new name. Why? Because we're in a new place. And I will not be the same. We will have our glorified bodies. Glorified bodies. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord said. Four things and four blessings. A place of honor in the temple of God. And again, we're not talking about a literal temple in heaven. There's no temple. We worship God. All of heaven is a place of worship. He will write his name on us. We will have eternal citizenship. Can't be kicked out. Can't be revoked. And we will be known by Jesus' new name. He's going to give us a new name. Revelation 21, and I close. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Folks, we messed this one up. <laughs> okay, when Adam and Eve sinned, and I've heard people say, well, I wasn't there, I wasn't in the garden. You would have done the same thing. Okay? We all make bad choices. We all have regrets in our lives. But do you realize that today could be the first day of the rest of your life? I really believe there is someone here that Satan has lied to you. He has said, you're good. You're good. Folks, I'm telling you, you being good is not going to get you into heaven. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you know that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven? This is what heaven is about. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven uh, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he shall be, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and their God. We'll be in the presence of God. We'll be in the presence of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will be there. In verse 4, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. It's all new. It's nothing like here on earth. It's not even like worship. I think we have a great worship time here. 
but it's nothing. There'll be no attitudes in heaven. There'll be no complaining in heaven. There will be no people, uh, you know, trying to impress people in heaven. It'll be about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Then he who sat on the throne, behold, I make all things new. Oh, I'm telling you, nothing like getting a new car or it's even better if you get a new truck. <laughs> you open that door, no mileage on it. Ooh, that ain't that spray. See, I get the new car spray and spray my truck, all right? And I just keep wishing. <laughs> but folks, when we get to heaven, it will be and we're, we're all that we have, all that we are. We are leaving that behind. No temptation. Can I get a hallelujah? The Bible says, I will make things all new. He said to me, for write these words because they are faithful and true. And he said, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. Matthew says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be blessed. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. Everything there is mine because my Father, God the Father, rules. He is king. It's all his. And we get to share in that. And I, and I will be his God and he shall be my son. He who overcomes. Overcomers. Life's not easy, folks. It's hard. But you can be an overcomer in your life. But he, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And this is the second death. Oh, listen to me, church. God provided a way for you to avoid hell. God provided a way through His Son, Jesus Christ. God allowed His only begotten Son to be sacrificed for our sin. God laid all the sins of the world on Jesus Christ. Every sin you've ever committed, He laid on Jesus Christ. And today, you have to have faith. If you come to Christ, you have to believe that you are a sinner, that Christ died for your sin, that there's no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ the Lord. Why? Because he didn't stay dead, folks. He was crucified on a cross, but three days later, he rose again. And because he rose again and lives eternally, we can live with him forever and ever and ever. Oh, listen to me. Philadelphia was a faithful church. My question today as we close, are you a faithful Christian? Are you a faithful Christian? God wants you to be. Folks, I'm not judging anybody here. The invitation is for all of us. And we as Christians need to be faithful to God. We need to be mission-minded. We need to be the gospel-minded. We need to be ministry minded those three things we as christians we need to do but if you're here today and you're not sure i pray i beg you today come to jesus today he will change your life therefore if any man be in christ he is a new cre creation old things are passed away all become New. Father, thank you for your word. and God, I thank you for the church at Philadelphia. God, I do think, I think we are a faithful church, but God, there's, there's still things we need to do. God, we need to reach out. We need to be concerned about the lost. We need to spend more time in prayer and more time in the word of God. I just thank you how your hand has been on our church. And God, it's your church. It's you. And God, we give you the glory and the praise. We are who we are because of you. And God, I thank you that we are going to heaven. 
We're going to spend all eternity with you. And God, my prayer today is if there's one soul here, one soul that doesn't know you, I pray today would be their day of salvation. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray if they have been convicted by the Holy Spirit, yeah, they're saved, they know they're saved, but they have not been all in for you. God, I pray that they would either just come to this altar and pray and make a promise to you, or even they talk to one of us and we can pray with them. And I pray that Christians would rededicate their life to Christ tonight. All that you've given us is amazing. All that you've given us is a blessing. And God, we could never repay you for what you have done for us. Others may need to come for baptism or even church membership. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. We give it to you. We give you the glory for anything that is done today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?